Greetings and salutations. You are listening to the Into the North podcast, where we take a look at the competitive side of the Commander format, also known as CEDH. I am one of your hosts, Morgan, aka Spleenface, and today I am joined by my co-host Matt, aka No. Hello. And special guest Yanis, aka You Can Call Me Jay. Hi guys. Uh, so Jay, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Janus, or most people call me Jay. Um, I am part of the team behind the exciting big tournament this August, the Tier 1 Con. And we also hosted a series of webcam tournaments um, throughout this winter. Um, in terms of me and my Magic history, I've been playing Magic for a bit more than 10 years. Um, I started out as... Like actually, way back in the day, I played as a kid in Ice Age. I played for a few years and then left the game for 10, 12 years. I got back into Magic in 2012 when uh, I started at university. And I've been playing ever since, steadily increasing my addiction throughout the years. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mostly played Legacy throughout the, all these years, but um, I think two or two and a half years ago, I tried CDH and immediately I got hooked. Uh, and I've been playing ever since. But I thought CDH Sweet. was only for people who just can't hack it in the real competitive formats. Um, <laughs> dude, CDH is like the nerdiest of magic formats. I don't know, man. I, yeah, I agree. I think like CDH is for all us uber nerds that just want to see how degenerate we can do magic, um, which is also kind of what attracted me to Legacy in the starting in the beginning. Um, I I started out playing uh, miracles and lands in Legacy. If you're familiar with those decks back in the day, so I was yeah. a hardcore control player um, for many many years. Well, I've heard that uh, having a tabernacle uh, in today's day and age is uh, a decent investment. So you set yourself I, up well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got lucky buying it roughly eight or nine years ago. Um, at the point, like it was the most expensive card that I ever bought. Uh, today, it was a really good investment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why didn't um, I just? Why didn't I just buy all the expensive cards when I was in middle school? It would have been so much better. <laughs> <laughs> hey, right. I uh, I actually have a fun anecdote. I remember when I was a kid, my mom took me to Copenhagen and um, the big uh, the local magic store. I was in there, um, so that was in like let's say ninety eight or ninety nine or something. Um, I was looking through their binder and I was seeing a Black Lotus for sale for twelve hundred Danish kroner, which is probably a bit more than two hundred dollars. And I thought to myself, who in their right mind would ever pay that much for a piece of cardboard? Yeah, that I've and... thought questions like that to myself a, a few too many times. <laughs> and now I am fully addicted and I am spending way too much money on cards that don't need to be expensive, but I somehow want to make them expensive. Yep. All right. Well, that uh, in this uh, in this episode, we're going to be covering, we're going more into depth on Tier 1 Con and what it's like organizing CDH tournaments. Uh, and I think we can just jump right into it. So, Jay, why don't you tell us about, uh, you know, Tier 1 Con and how it got started? Sure thing. Um, so, um mess the to of uh, the tier one con tournaments and i have been friends for yeah basically my entire time playing magic he was one of the guys that introduced me to legacy and like i got invited into this uh, little group of friends that were all playing legacy and um, mess was part of that group and we slowly became friends and started seeing each other outside of uh, playing Magic and um, I think it was around uh, fall last year so during the lockdown we were talking that there was this void in the Danish Magic scene um, for tournaments because all the stores closed down due to the lockdown and nobody was doing anything so we just decided that 
why don't we just do something? Because we have both of us um, been organizing um, tournaments in the past. And uh, we started uh, working on a rules document and all the stuff you need to host a tournament. Then we quickly realized that we wouldn't have the funds or the uh, broadband to sort of host this alone. So we contacted uh, some guys we both know through playing Magic um, th that owned a store, which is Tier 1. Um, so Mass and I are actually not working for Tier 1, so to speak. We're working with Tier 1. We are our own separate entity um, working with a store. And um, that's sort of how the webcam series come to live. Um, initially, we were just going to have a few commander tournaments. But after the moderate success of the first one, um, we were convinced to add legacy and old school to um, our palette. So we actually ended up making four commander tournaments, three old school tournaments, and two legacy tournaments though one of them got cancelled in since january oh man so, yeah i did not know that uh you guys ran other formats oh yeah so uh, i have not had many saturdays off since the end of january because we basically had a tournament each saturday and um, <laughs> mess took the role of uh, the behind the scenes to and then i because the guys from the store wanted to stream it then that became my role. I um, when we had our first commander tournament, that was my first time ever uh, covering any sort of magic. <laughs> um, so yeah, we just well that, that jumped right into so it so much. Exactly wow. right. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I the initial tournaments were a bit rough, but I think we got a. Um, a great product in the end and I am super excited for the big tournament in August um, yeah I mean I have to say I think you guys actually I think you're selling yourself short a little bit um, I think you guys did a really good job and the, like one thing that I really liked was um, you had sort of plans for downtime uh, obviously you know there are reasons that that people who organize other tournaments don't necessarily have those and being affiliated with the store probably helped but like it was really nice yeah. that there wasn't you know a lot of dead time just waiting for the next round or whatever you had you know you talked about like you know the, the giveaways and things like that and you you know got some deck techs recorded and stuff like that um and yeah i think yeah that, like, i mean you know obviously i was never going to pass up the opportunity to take a little <laughs> jab but the, the coverage was actually was actually quite good oh i i i I do feel like I might have earned that jab because I might have delivered once or twice during the tournaments you participated in. Maybe, maybe. But, maybe. Uh, Allegedly. Allegedly, yeah. But there, there are luckily, only recordings proving things, yeah, that's all. It's not like it was recorded or anything. Exactly. But you did get your uh, the only clip that was made <laughs> out of our... Uh, webcam series was me praising you right or was i just yeah i think i think that uh you know i i took the the three nice words you said in a row and i, I went all right that's getting that's getting immortalized <laughs> yeah, um well, so the, um, yeah why don't we you you know you said you started with uh originally you had just the commander webcam series and then you expanded into other formats why don't you talk about the the commander webcam series and sort of how you know how things started initially and how they grew yeah so um we had this initial tournament we had basically no idea how successful we're gonna be because uh f first of all we, we are europeans and a lot of this community especially in sort in terms of content and tournaments had been uh, from north america so we were unsure if we could get the uh, guys from the uh, across the Atlantic to participate, but we actually got around 40 participants at our first um, tournament, which was a decent number, but um, it steadily grew from there. I think there was a bit more than 60 
for the second one, then around 80 or 90 for the third one, and then was it 110 or something for the final one. Um, most importantly, there was people from China, Taiwan, Australia, Germany, Norway, Finland, Mexico, US, Canada, Chile, like basically all continents except Africa was covered. And I think that was amazing, um, getting that far out in such a short amount of time. Yeah, and it's awesome to see people, you know, even even with the uh, obvious inconvenience of the time zones, people actually, like, getting, you know, making the effort to, to make it out, even when it starts at 3 a.m. or whatever it is, their time. Yeah, yeah, we had people, I think you guys, you were up at 3 a.m., and then we had the guys in the east that started, like, at midnight um, and just played for 12 hours, like, I was amazed about the support we got, but as we <laughs> mentioned at the beginning, people that play CDH tend to be heavily enfranchised players because it is such a complex format, and it is for obviously, um, if you don't proxy, it is ridiculously, ridiculously expensive to get into. Um, so I do believe that in terms of the various formats in magic cdh has some of the most enfranchised players which we can also see like i mean every other cdh player is also a content creator it feels like <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a little bit of that exactly um but but that's a good thing i mean um you guys and uh, Braden and all you guys were part of the inspiration for us to believe that we could actually achieve this um so so that's good well, thanks. That's, uh, you know, it's good to hear. We've all, you know, people, like, when the CDH cast started up, people joked, like, oh, it's, you know, like, your rivals or whatever, and I don't know, I think our view is just, you know, more content equals more better, and, you know, more tournaments, yeah. more podcasts, more streams, more gameplay videos. I think, I mean, the one thing I could see is, like, multiple streams happening at the same time is is obviously a little bit unfortunate yeah. but uh, like apart from that i i think that there's there's room for as much content as people are willing to produce um exactly because we also as being as in franchise as we are we also consume a lot of content we have a craving for a lot of content and nowadays there you can basically watch multiple hours of new cdh content basically every day which is pretty unique for such a small format. Yeah, see see we don't we don't upload super frequently. That's why all our episodes <laughs> are like 3 hours long cuz we need to make sure that we're, <laughs> we're doing our part, right? But that's fine like because all the others are uploading all the time. There's so much content and again, that is a good thing. Um so a bit back to the tier 1 thing. So Mass and I we are old I don't want to say GP grinders, but we enjoyed taking uh, or traveling to one or two GPs a year just for like the going away with your friends for a weekend to a nice city, play some magic, go out, have some fun. Um, I absolutely love that. And we wanted to see if we could recreate that for CDH because we actually believe that CDH is a fantastic format and also is a great tournament format um both i mean it is pretty hard to get into as a viewer if you're not playing yourself but as soon as you're into it you can follow the tournament or the coverage pretty easily and you can see like yeah how do you say that um yeah i don't know uh, it translates well um the action there's a lot of action in this uh format that's what i was trying to say yeah there's a lot of action and it's in that sense like captivating and entertaining um, exactly and there's a lot of out and there's i mean you know sometimes games can last a long time sometimes games can be quite short and like uh i don't know i guess anticipating that is always enjoyable yeah it, it, we for me it's the big and splashy things that are fun uh also when they go wrong it is, as uh, Morgan talked about in the uh, in the pre-show, uh, the uh, windfall into uh, and uh, hull preacher stuff. Those big plays you don't really get that in any other format, um, and that is what I think attracts a lot of players. 
yeah, is the no... uniqueness of the board states. Yeah, how to interact against three other players. Exactly. <laughs> and I definitely think the the you know like big CDH blowouts are uh, are a lot bigger than anything you get in in as Completely. sort of a regular course of gameplay in other formats. Yeah, so <laughs> fun anecdote. I recently introduced a, a legacy friend to um to CDH and in his first game he cast a time twister which was also the first time twister he ever cast because he was a legacy only player and i responded with a notion thief and that was his first match of cdh and retrospectively i don't think that was the best introduction to the format <laughs> but at least he got to see how insanely ridiculous this format can be it's a tough lesson you know it is, you just <laughs> it is. Have your hand shuffled in and uh gone forever. yes yeah, that's uh, you know, CDH is really is really just about absolutely dunking on your friends, right? Like you just exactly you invite them. You're like, hey, check this out. I think it'll be fun. And also, yeah. you have absolutely nothing left. I've taken everything. I win. You lose. Good day. Exactly. He also uh, he's he's not used to politics. Not that it's that th big of a thing in in uh, CDH, but there is a conversation to be had often. And he's not used to uh, that from Legacy because it's just one on one. Like you don't really, you don't need to interact with your opponent, so to speak. Um, but he was surprised about like how you navigate through your words, the game, um, how much uh, that impacted the game. Yeah, I think it's like a little weird when you think about other formats and you realize they actually like th the concept of threat assessment just like isn't really a thing. Um, because it's like anything your opponent is doing is a threat, right? And anything you can do to answer it answers the threat. And there's not like, oh, is this more of a threat to me or that person? Are they more likely to answer it? Or it's just um, like, I think a lot of the, obviously like there's still very intricate play patterns and like saving, conserving your resources and using them as efficiently as possible. But there's so many fewer opportunities to to like leverage other people. I mean, there's no other people's resources, but there's fewer uh, opportunities to say like, this card is bad for me, but I'm actually going to leave it in play because, you know, of various other factors that often Ex have to think exactly. of one. Yeah. And to this day, still like threat assessment for me is still difficult uh, because the format keeps getting more and more complex and we get these insane haymakers in every set now it seems that the entirety of threat assessment is i think you could like uh, write numerous books on it just like steve menendian wrote a book on the card gosh somebody <laughs> yeah. smarter than me could write a long book on threat assessment in cdh I mean, well, speaking of long form text and CDH, I mean, just deck primers <laughs> in general yeah. are uh, pretty elaborate. Exactly. <laughs> uh, it's the the eternal competition of who can write the longest the longest primer. What are we're up to like seventy pages now or something? Oh, I remember the Corvold Discord came out with like a fifty something page primer, and then the Frog server went, "Well, we're gonna make one even longer." And then, uh, <laughs> Yeah, okay. There is a point where it starts getting ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, it's hard and to it, find it, the it, information you actually need. It, yeah, <laughs> and it is a lot earlier than 50 pages. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, all the, the primers I've written, I've sort of aimed for like, okay, let's let's go for, you know, 1,500, maybe 2,000 words and then call it there. Yeah. Like, like four pages of text is probably enough. Yeah, uh, I agree. So, uh, uh, I guess we should uh, potentially get get back on track a little bit. Yeah, just, so, just a uh, tad. Yeah, why don't you uh, why don't you talk about you know all the stuff that's happening at the in person event in the summer? Okay, I would love to. So, Tier One Con is on August thirteenth to fifteenth in Copenhagen, Denmark. It is a community driven event backed by the store Tier One MTG. 
So the big main event, um, we decided why not be brazen from the beginning and just call it the World Cup um, from uh, for CDH because at at least the venue and the price structure is, as far as I know, the biggest ever in CDH. Um, to those that don't know, we are giving away a full set of revised dual lands for the final table. And if there is 250 players, the winner of that table will then instead get a unlimited time twister, and then the three other players will share the 10 duels between them. Wow. Yeah. That uh, Mass and I did not know about the uh, the time twister. The tier one guys just surprised us with it, and our jaw just dropped because we all know what a time twister is worth these days. Honestly, do yeah. we? I feel like it just it goes up so fast <laughs> that that like every time yeah, I yeah. turn around, it's like yeah. it's like I thought it was six thousand dollars. No, it's eight thousand dollars. Oh, I thought okay, I guess it's eight thousand dollars. Two weeks later, it's ten thousand dollars. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. The, the difference between the price when it was announced at the like last tier one con, the the, the last web series versus now is oh ridiculous. yeah, it is insane what is happening. The stakes uh... are only getting higher. It is, and obviously, we want to give away the time twister. So I really hope that the community supports and shows up. In uh, but we are aware that it is a difficult time in the world now with COVID and all that. But at least here in Denmark, in a lot of countries, vaccines are starting to roll out, and I am confident that we can get this up and running um, and being great. But as I mentioned, this is basically. A community thing. Um, so Mess and I are sort of the CDH guys in this. We have the CDH tournament. That's our responsibility. Um, it's a two-day tournament starting Monday. Uh, sorry, uh, Saturday morning, and then there's uh, a few rounds on set, uh, Sunday, and then the top, whatever it is. I actually can't remember if it's top uh, sixteen. I, I believe it is. Um, but we also have a Danish group called um, CommanderCon, which is all about casual magic. And they are hosting a ton of side events. Uh, among that are a pre-con commander tournament where you enter and then you get a random commander pre-con from all the way back from the, I believe the, was it 2013, the first set came out, up until the Dungeons and Dragons pre-con, which will be released a few weeks before the tournament, and then you just build your deck based on that, and I think that's going to be fun. And then we have all the various small uh, um, multiplayer formats. Uh, there's Two-Handed Giant, Pentagram, uh, Conspiracy Draft, Plane Chase, Arch Enemy. I mean, you can basically play whatever you want, and all that is free. Commander Legends draft, yeah, these, uh, yeah. these yeah. look pretty. Yeah, there's a there's a dual commander qualifier and a dual yes. commander championship, which I exactly. think is really cool. And that's on Sunday. That we have a few guys here in Denmark that really love dual commander, so they are hosting the Danish championship of dual commander on Sunday, and uh, we will cover the finals of that after the finals of the CDH um, tournament. And uh, also, this is um, something I'm quite excited about. On Friday, uh, the first day of the tournament, we are doing a lot of fun stuff, um, content-wise. We are, but the thing I'm mostly excited about is we are hosting a CDH panel, um, where Jim from the Spike Feeders will be participating, Ian will be participating, uh, comedian, obviously. Um, Baal from Split Second will be participating. Um, one of you lovely gents, if you show up, have promised me <laughs> to participate. Yeah. And um, if if there is an open seat, I might just go in there just to uh, spew some nonsense to uh, now even it out a bit. Now the motivation behind being involved in the organization, so you can put yourself yes. on the panel. It's uh, a that, that that was Mass's idea. <laughs> I actually. Uh, I wanted to have you guys with, but we want at least five people on the panel. Um, and I feel like I'm missing someone. Um, 
oh yeah, Joe King was supposed uh, supposed to uh, be part of it, but uh, he's focused on the tournament. Um, and that's another thing. We are flying in Joe King from the Marchesa tournaments, and he's gonna be the TO for the CDH tournament. So we are in good hands because Joe King and Tyler from the Marchesa uh, they were the guys behind the bot that we used at the webcam series um, to make all the pairings and all that. Um, so we are super excited to have him uh, come in and participate and make sure that the experience is as close as we can come to had this been an official Wizards CDH GP. It's going to be official judges and all that stuff. And yeah, you mentioned like you, you wanted to encapsulate the GP experience. Um, exactly. That you and it really does like feel like it with all the side events and presumably you know tier one's gonna be there as like a vendor and they are and uh, we also course, have uh, and... we have some art uh, artists coming as well um mostly artists that do altars but that's also pretty big in cdh is my understanding and if i am not mistaken uh, our danish friend jesper ising will show up and uh, participate in various tournaments throughout the weekend so uh, you can, uh, if you're lucky, you can get matched in a pot with Jesper. <laughs> I, I guess he'll, uh, <laughs> given that given that he did the art for Thassa's Oracle, I guess he'll get to see a lot of players playing with his art, huh? Yeah, and so we, he was also the one giving us the artist proof uh, we gave away for our webcam tournament because we, oh, we are... Sense, yeah. We know Jesper, or at least Mass is friends with him privately, and I've seen him a few times as well. And he's he's just the nicest guy ever, and uh, wanted to help us make this. Um, so he helped us with the uh, play mats and the uh, the uh, artist proofs. Yeah, those were those were definitely like uh, those are really good prizes for the for the first one because you know they don't like they're not. Um, you know, super expensive cards that the store has to give away for like a free online tournament, but they're you know unique and like a cool thing to have, and also the fact that you know they're they're like signed exactly. by the artist was uh, yeah. Was so that really was cool. it was sort of difficult to pri like decide on the prizes for the um, tier one webcam series because we wanted to have a prize that people wanted to win, but it it could not be so big a prize that people were incentivized to do sketchy things because it was valuable in that sense. Uh, yeah. But I think we landed on a, on a good compromise. Um, and to my understanding, uh, at least I didn't get any feedback from any players that they felt that somebody cheated or there was anything sketchy going on. And in all sorts of like, all the feedback we, we got was... Uh, so nice and uh we people seem to really enjoy our tournaments and that made us just want to do it even more and uh yeah i'm so excited about for the uh the live event and to see the community come together and all the these people that you don't really have faces or names on you just have this online nickname um so it, it's going to be nice to put a face and a name to those yeah, it's definitely gonna be uh, gonna be cool to see, like, you know, I mean, for people you don't know, people you like have played against once, people you've played against a whole bunch of times, like, to actually meet up. That was um, a bunch of content creators went to uh, the Grand Prix Las Vegas in uh, in twenty nineteen, and yeah. uh, that was like, it was definitely a really fun experience to like meet all these people who you know some of them it's like oh i know who you are like uh like the playing with power guys you know i'd i'd like yeah talk with them a little bit um or like people who i'd actually interacted with a lot um it was it was pretty cool to like you know meet them all in person and like grab lunch together and you know hang out play games uh sign each other's cards and play mats and you know yeah, exactly. And unfortunately, I don't think I'll have much time during the weekend, or at least my free time will be in the late hours of the night. <clears throat> Sorry. But um, one of the things that I cherish most about the GPs are the post-tournament 
games in the hotel bar at or at the restaurant or wherever where you're just like winding down having a laugh with your friends having a beer playing some games and just having the time of your life I, it that's really what i missed about going to gps um not so much the actual tournament it's all the things you do around the tournament that i um, i really miss and that's sort of what we are trying to recreate here yeah, I mean, definitely in the past year, that's something I've <laughs> missed, kind of just generically, like the week, like the weekly in-person meeting, you know. But it exactly. feels like uh, this is going to be kind of like coming back into the world to play Magic, which will be really awesome. Uh, yeah, definitely a, a good way to sort of uh, to break that ice again and and get that started up again. Yeah, and Copenhagen is lovely in August. Um, it's not that lovely for that. Mo- long period but uh, from july to august copenhagen is amazing so yeah I'm de- I mean, I'm, maybe i'm speaking for myself but i'm definitely not just going to spend a weekend there <laughs> no i also think flying from for, for you guys from canada to copenhagen uh, is a bit rough for three days only uh, but copenhagen is a great city uh, especially in the summer and and we hope to see the community back up on this because I'm sure if this becomes the success that we hope it will, I'm sure Tier 1 will want to do it again. But obviously, we need people to participate. So, um, And obviously, we, we need the feedback as well. What can be better? Yeah, well, I mean, I think you guys also did a really good job. Um, like, each each one of the... The tier one con events, you know, you certainly like like the the online events. You guys certainly, you know, made improvements and, and they got bigger and better as they went on. So uh, certainly hopeful that you guys can continue that trend and uh, tier one. Oh, I'm sure will be awesome. Yeah, it was definitely a stated goal to improve every time, and and now obviously we we are hoping to uh, break the scale for the uh, August tournament, and I think. I think um, I have high, I have high hopes um, for the tournament, and I I'm super excited to see, as you guys said, uh, live play again, and just uh, all the interviews and the deck techs we did um, for the webcam series um, was a bit clunky because they were not in person. So I'm looking forward to doing all the interviews and all the deck techs live with the people, um, because you just like. When you see somebody that's like built their own deck and have a passion for it, you can just feel it in their voice when they talk about it, and they're really excited to show the, this deck to the world. Um, so that's something I'm excited yeah. about. Yeah, it's the same experience, honestly, with podcasts. Like our in-person episodes are, we definitely have the best chemistry, and that it's like it's hard to reproduce that over Discord, and especially over video when like there's a delay and yeah definitely. So that'll be cool um all right so, so uh you know you talked about you know improving every time and you had some experience uh you know organizing tournaments in in other formats like legacy um what what sort of challenges uh i mean first did you anticipate when you started organizing uh commander tournaments and then you know what are some of the challenges that you guys didn't anticipate but you've had to you know learn and adapt i wanted you sort of walk us through that yeah process. so um prior to the first webcam series i don't think mass has had ever organized a commander tournament i had organized the one cdh tournament in august last year and i used this weird terminal program on my Mac that some clever person uh, made, but it was very rough, meaning that if I made one mistake, it erased everything. And as you know, that happened a few times (laughs) during (laughs) our five round tournament. Um, So that was rough. Um, So we knew going into this that the biggest issue was going to create pairings because creating a pairings for a four-person pot 
where you don't want to see three people pots, so you have to consider buys. You want to make sure that people don't meet the same people more than once. It quickly grew out of um, our hands, so um, Mass actually found Tyler and um, Joking from um, the Marchesa, and they were developing this bot that we then could test for them, and that was a godsend for us because I, I honestly have no idea what we were going to do without that bot to handle the pairings for us. Um, but luckily for me, Mass took that responsibility <laughs> because he was the backroom staff and I was in front of the camera. Um, but huge uh, head off for Mass and Tyler and um, joking for um, ha running the tournament behind the scenes. Uh, I know that especially the first few months where Mass was stressed. Um, I didn't get to experience a lot of it because I was in front of the camera basically for 12 hours, so I could just see Mass running in the background being stressed. And uh, I hope it didn't affect the players too much, and I, I know that we uh, we were better as the tournaments progressed, but uh, it was rough in the beginning. And... Uh, after this, uh, I don't think like I will ever complain about uh, uh, organizing a one against one tournament because that is comparatively nothing to a multiplayer tournament. <laughs> I uh... I mean, if somebody can create a program that can handle this flawlessly, they're a genius. I, I hopefully it'll be easier in the summer because I think a lot of the issues that have been experienced with uh with like the the Discord bots and things like that have actually been related to like reporting and inputs as opposed to like just handling the actual information itself. So when you don't have like people trying to use a Discord bot to input their results, hopefully that will eliminate one of the the sources. Of I those hope problems. so. But, uh, just, but uh, as I said, yeah, oh, we, we have like J Joker come, uh, joking coming in, and I think that that is uh, so important for this tournament to be a success because we cannot have rounds going forever because uh, pairings are a mess. And I am sure he will make this uh, a very nice experience for everyone in it. Yeah, that uh, you know, talking about the the pairings just reminded me. I think it was the second time twisted tournament that i was commentating and i just watched as um basically so they were doing like a swiss pairing system so winners were paired against winners um, but obviously you know you don't have a clean number of no no of winners like it's much you know there's a lot more pair ups and pair downs when you're doing four person pods as opposed to two person pods and there were just like two or three people who they had the best breakers after i guess it was after round two so they got paired up which makes sense, except then if you think about it, that means that they're gonna have even they got paired up, so they're gonna have even better tiebreakers. Yes. So they got paired up in round three as well. So then they had even better tiebreakers. So they got paired up in round four, and it was just like, yeah, I, I don't think this is I don't think this is what what was intended. But there were just a couple people who like rode breakers through three or four rounds. Um, yeah, it is uh, it is a mess and. Uh... I applaud uh, Mess and uh, Joking for uh, taking that task upon them because, like, I mean, I have to be in front of camera for like 12 hours, three days in a row, basically, but I would much rather do that than having to uh, do uh, the uh, all the backroom stuff because that is big brain time. Yeah, I feel like uh, having having commentated some tournaments, if you make a mistake, like you miss a card that's in play, or you know, you say something wrong, you just go like, oh, whoops, I forgot about this, and then move on. <laughs> yeah. Whereas if you make a mistake as the tournament organizer, uh, you might have some angry people. Yes. Um, but I uh, I don't... You, you, are, you participated in all four of our webcam series, right? Yes. My understanding was that... There was generally a good spirit in our community, and especially for the latter tournaments, people were hanging out in the lounge uh, Discord, and seemed like people were having a great time. Um, so I hope we can translate that to people also having a great time when they meet face to face. I'm definitely um, that's definitely something I've observed at the CEDH events. Now maybe it's I haven't done as many 
like one v one online events, so maybe it's just an online thing. But at the CDH events I've always seen, it's there's been like a great sense of community and camaraderie between rounds that exists a bit. You know, like people have their playgroups and their friends who they hang out with uh, of course. In, at one v one tournaments. But there was less of a sense of like everyone's you know coming here and hanging out like as opposed to like you know you have your group of five or six friends who you're hanging out with between rounds oh yeah i i was definitely like so sometimes when there was a bit of downtime if i'm in a match or we had like to segue between stuff i peeked into the discord uh just to see how it's going and sometimes it blew my mind like i just saw like 70 people in the lounge chat uh, uh what's it called the uh, discord thing channel and i was just like blowing my mind that 70 people from all over the world was just sitting and chatting together as if they were all friends. So we've, we've talked a little bit about, about the matchmaking. Are there any other uh, challenges that you know, you've know you found in organizing these CDH tournaments? I know ra- yeah. rounds have a tendency to be a little more variable in how long they last. Uh... Ex- exactly. There is... Um... Round time is a hot topic, I, I guess, um, because some people feel like that we, we decided that I believe it was 90 minute rounds we had. Yeah, I think that's right. Or no, no, 75 minute rounds. I feel like there, you might have done 90 once um, and then 70. Uh, for some reason, yeah, I, co- I remember it switching, but I could just be mixing up different tournaments. Yeah, it, it could also be that. After the first one, we I, no, I, I think we set 75 because uh, we tried to calculate that with 90 minute rounds, the day would just be too long, um, especially with the problems we experienced in the initial tournaments. Um, but I also recognize that 75 minute rounds is it's rough on stacks players if they're not super experienced with their deck. Um, they have to play tight to win in 75 minutes. Um, so that was one of the feedback points we got. Um, but I, then again, you have to turn around. If the rounds are 90 minutes, that means that the pot that ends in three minutes because uh, the turbo nose stake was lucky and had the god hand, they have to wait a long time before playing again. Um, so that is something that you have to experiment a bit with. I, I feel like to find that sweet spot. I'm not sure 75 minutes is the sweet spot, but it's some. It's not far from that, I believe. I think a short, and honestly, I think a short round time um, becomes less of, pro- of a problem the more rounds there are. Like if there are games where you kind of struggle to, to finish with your stack deck, like you can make up for it later. Like a draw is not the end of the world. Yeah, sort of yeah. I think the more rounds. the more rounds there are, especially like then you know if you can pick up like a if you can start actually picking up like multiple draws, you can you know uh, create a win in the aggregate. And yeah, like you know in a three round tournament, like one draw is one game you didn't win, and you know maybe you won't make top eight if you're like if you have one win, one draw, one loss. Um, but you know in a eight round tournament, like having you know, three wins, two draws, or whatever is, like, actually a pretty good result, and you can, like, that might actually put you ahead of, uh, ahead of, or, like, getting the draws is actually, rather than being, oh, I lost an opportunity to get a win, it's like, oh, I actually, I picked up a point in that round, uh, which, you know, puts me ahead of everyone else who has three wins or whatever. Uh, yeah, exactly. Of it. And um, then the last thing is sort of how you decide to make the top whatever. So we decided that whoever won the Swiss rounds, so to speak, was put directly into the uh, the, the finals. And then we had three semifinals with one player each advancing. Um, that's one way to do it. You could also just say, okay, it's going to be a top 16, and then the four winners go to the final. Um we were a bit unfortunate uh, with two of the tournaments where two of our finalists dropped out, <laughs> meaning that we had to decide how to replace them. Um, and oh, that's odd. Yeah, um, but uh, 
like both of them were time constrained um, because the tournaments did drag out. Um, I mean, the last one was ridiculous. I think one of the uh, semifinals was close to three hours in the last one. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I remember that. that. <laughs> I remember in the fir- in the first one, I I was the one who finished first in the Swiss, and I like because I'd woken up at whatever it was two a.m. to play, uh, maybe three. I was like, do do I have time to take a nap? And then I was like, you know what, I won't, because if the games all end quickly, <laughs> then like I don't want to, you know, be asleep when when the next round starts. And then I just sat there watching like this two plus hour yeah. stacks game drag out. I was like, man, I could have had such a good nap. <laughs> and I, I gotta <laughs> admit, some of those uh, long, like two hour plus stacks games are super difficult to commentate or cover because. Like at a certain point, the board states are so messy and nothing really happens, and you you have to try and create this narrative like what is going on, who's gonna win, and for some reason, whenever I opened my mouth and said I think this guy will win, or I don't think this guy will win, the exact opposite happened, and like it happened every tournament. Oh yeah, it's the commentator curse. That's the... yeah. You call, you make a prediction. You're just, uh, you're just immediately you've cursed that player. It's not going to come true. It's yes. So I will not make any predictions on your behalf if you guys show up. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we'll, we'll um, see. No, no. You predict we're just going to lose, right? And then yeah. Okay. Sure. I can do right, that. But if you predicted that you won't make any predictions, doesn't that mean that they're going to be predictions? Oh, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Too meta. Too meta. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, that's sort of the biggest issue we run into. I am sure if you talk to a mess, because again, I was a bit removed from uh, the organi- uh, organization fast, um, because I was just there for the initial uh, planning, and then I was in front of the camera, and all the content and then was what I focused on so I'm sure if you ever get the chance to talk with Mass he can lecture you for hours about what is difficult about it better than I can all right well um is there is there anything any other challenges you want to talk about or should we move on to uh to our next little Uh, section yes let's move on to our the next hot topic oh yes this one (laughs) famously never controversial I don't think there's ever been uh, uh, a heated discussion about this anywhere, and that is no, everybody uh, that is, just agrees. Everyone just agrees on proxies. So why don't yes. you, uh, you know, tell us what what the policy is at Tier One Con, and then, uh, you know, maybe go into, you know, what yes. your, uh, you know, the the rationale so, behind that and your uh, your views. And- uh, again here. Um, I am just the messenger here. Um, this is um, something that Mess and Joking and the owners of Tier 1 has spent at least two months on finding a solution for this. I don't want to call it issue, but like the elephant in the room that is the reserve list. So, Tier 1 uh, is a WPN certified retailer. And they are aiming to become a premium store for all those that know magic terminology that depends on their allocation of product product and such. So they have to be extremely careful what they allow their name to be associated with. And proxies are, as you know, a thing of debate even from wizard's side um but um what we or mass and like no what we came to do is that we are not allowing proxies but we are allowing playtest cards and we have made a predetermined list of 35 of the most expensive cdh cards and uh, you can find that list on our website and when you register for the tournament, you just let us know which of the 35 cards you want to include in your deck, and we will provide you with playtest cards of those cards. 
So you will get a card from us that will be a playtest card of a, let's say, time twister. Then after the tournament, you hand that one back because it is a property of tier one. And that way we can get around the, again, the elephant in the room of allowing non-real magic cards in a tournament setting. Um, it, it is a bit convoluted, but and I am not sure I explained it perfectly, but I'm sure we can uh, share a link to um, all the rules and all that um, in the show notes or something. Um, but I think it's a great compromise. Um, obviously, we can't make anybody, everyone happy, um, but I think uh, this is a fine solution. Um, yeah. I, I wholeheartedly agree. I think this is um, a really fine um, solution. Um, like I am coming from the perspective of owning a, a decent amount of these cards, and that wouldn't have been a problem, but I know that this community in particular is super open to proxies and encourages it, especially you know in the same age where it's harder to get your access to, to cards like people have multiple fully proxy decks and like that's going to be a barrier but this is i think really reasonable uh, especially if like you're flying out to this tournament um you know being prepared with the majority of the cards in your deck seems like um really reasonable and then um also providing the playtest cards is i mean even if it's kind of just to get around the rule i think is a really ingenious um, approach because then it's like you don't have to worry about finding a printer if you don't have access to a printer or like having you know varying qualities of print like this way there's going to be a very consistent um, quality and also they fit in the sleeves so there's no yeah. irregularity and um, yeah and that, that regard and I can tell you like we identified this issues like back in November and ever since Mass and I and Tier 1 and then Joking got added, we have been talking how to find a solution for, for this. Because we know that in this day and age, with the reserve list being what it is, m very few players have all the cards. I'm lucky enough, I've been playing Legacy for 10 years, so I got the bulk majority of my cards when they were a lot more reasonable in price. If I were to enter the format today, I don't know what I would do. Um, so I, uh, I think this is a solution that works for Wizards. This is a solution that works for Tier 1. And this is hopefully a solution that works for the majority of people interested in participating in this tournament. Yeah, and, and I think policies like this are also good. You know, obviously, like, I... You know, in sort of an idealized world, you know, every... I mean, in an in an ideal world, the cards just wouldn't be as expensive as they are, but that's yes. a little beyond the control. You know, I, I would like if it, you know, things could just be full proxy, but obviously, you know, I understand that stores need to make money. Like, they're providing a service by putting this tournament on, and yeah. I think that, you know, saying, okay, we'll remove, like, the the sort of insurmountable barriers to entry. You don't have to buy... I mean, obviously, Time Twister's the poster child of this, but... But even cards, you know, like buying a f the set of underground sea or yeah, like oh, you have to buy. You're bringing like, you know, Thrasios Timna. So, well, underground seas, uh, you know, a thousand and whatever. Tropical island is another eight hundred. Like, how much is buy you? You know, spend four thousand dollars on your land base. Um, exactly. You know, eight hundred dollars on the imperial seal. Oh, do you need a cradle? Well, that's another. Um, so so like taking that and and saying okay you know if you need to you know buy the rest of your like fetch lands or you know you need like some you know card like oh you don't have a mana drain or like things like that then like it provides an incentive for people to you know buy cards from a store but also makes it reasonable for them to want to participate in events like this uh, and i think that's a really good compromise where everyone can sort of win yeah and again it is an awkward conversation a lot of the time um because people are coming from all sorts of different backgrounds and have 
different like some countries cards are just hard to come by um and again we also have to recognize i fully understand that tier one and wizards to extent would not be happy if we just said just show up with your 100 pieces of printed out paper and we will <laughs> promote this as the biggest magic tournament for a multiplayer in the world I, I'm, everybody has to like get something out of this um as, as like mass and i we are <laughs> we're doing this out of the love of uh for magic but obviously tier one is the one banking us in that sense so they obviously also need to get something out of this and if we just allow everybody to come with their pieces of paper i don't think they will sell a lot of cards and we have to acknowledge that that is how stores survive and if stores don't survive they cannot support tournament play if there's no tournament play then the format slowly dies yeah um but yeah it it's it is imp- i think it is impossible to make everybody happy but i think uh, we found a solution that can make most people happy yeah and yeah just kind of a point that i want to say is um even if you can't necessarily fully assemble your deck um especially if it's just kind of the small things like um maybe certain cards that aren't on this proxy list um generally speaking it's the more skilled players that make it to the finals like i wouldn't it's def it doesn't always feel like a pay to win game um when you've got the majority of the cards kind of assembled so i think this selection of cards minimizes that question um to kind of make it negligible so i appreciate that yeah like yeah you're yeah. not gonna be missing too many like huge really important yeah uh, cards like led is like part of one of the you know best exactly. combos in the format right now and if you don't have your leds then or led then that's a huge problem but um well, you just Matt. have to say hey i need a proxy <laughs> Just flexing, yes. flexing on everyone with your play set of LEDs. What? I get it. I get it. <laughs> and I'm like, I am not a mathematical genius or anyway, but in my mind, it makes sense that the stores need to sell cards in order to survive. And if <laughs> everybody are just proxying and not buying cards, then their stores are closing. And if the stores are closing, you don't have uh, the flow of new players to sort of like cu- go up the ranks and come to CDH because I think it's a very natural flow of people by a precon. They sort of start there and they sort of enter this arms race and in a couple of years they will reach CDH unless they are determined to play at a certain price or power level. Um, but in my experience... And I've honestly, I've never played Casual Commander. Uh, I started out in CDH, um, so I, I don't have the experience. But what I hear from a lot of friends is that that it ha- is what happened to their play groups because then one guy got a duel and then the other guys got it, and then you sort of push each other, um, and then you end up in CDH. Yeah. Oh yeah, that that <laughs> I could certainly uh, confirm that. Uh, for us, it was. Uh... It was a green-white Sylvala deck that I think was kind of the gauntlet uh, that that one guy had. Um, and what it, does Tooth and Nail say again? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, so it was like, okay, you know, this is sort of the the deck to beat from our perspective. You know, how can we beat it? And then things just sort of spiraled a bit from there. Um, and yeah, yeah, I, mean, I, I remember are a it big from part uh, of getting players into the game for sure. Oh, they definitely are, and I. Again, I am not a economical or mathematical genius in a way, so if somebody can uh, tell me that I'm completely wrong, that proxies are good for the... like, it, they, it is definitely good for the game because it exposes more people to the, uh, the game, but at a certain point, I've also seen people that are just... like, they don't own magic cards anymore because they are proxying everything. And I don't think that player is healthy for the game in the long run. Yeah, I think I think yep. what I've said in the past is that, you know, magic is a hobby and you should approach it, you know, with the idea that you're going to spend some money on it. 
And that doesn't mean yeah. you have to spend $10,000 on a time twister. But if you're saying, no, no, like, that... I'm going to exactly. go to a store, use their space, you know, play, uh, you know, use the cards that Wizards creates and, you know, never give anyone a dime, then that's obviously not, like, a sus exactly. sustainable uh, thing for everyone to do. Yeah. Um, and again, I know I am going to get a lot of flack for my comments here and... Um... I wish I could make everybody happy here. Um, we've tried to make as many of you happy, and uh, I, I hope that people will uh, accept that we were under some restrictions in uh, creating this tournament. I'd like to think that our audience is uh, is reasonable enough to understand where you're coming from on this. Uh, but, you know, there, there, there will certainly be... Uh... Yes. Some people who, oh. are, who are unhappy no matter what you do. Oh yeah, you, you cannot win everybody over, but uh, as I've mentioned multiple times, I, uh, I think the guys found a great solution, and uh, I think that makes most of the players that were interested in playing participating able to participate. And we have to mention another thing, at least here in Copenhagen, people are extremely good at helping each other by lending cards or deck if you need it for a tournament. And that's also part of the GP experience, the late night running around trying to find the last uh, piece of spice that you want to include in your deck or you want to rent some cards or you decide, oh, you brought your uh, Thrasios Tumna deck, but now you want to play Tumna Crown and you have to switch it all up and you need some cards. Um, yeah, that, it's part of the charm. <laughs> that uh, yeah. that was me with my uh, my GP. That was uh, can I track down the last uh, Gideon ally of Zendikar to borrow from somebody? Because <laughs> that card it was like forty dollars at the like... time. None of the stores had any because it was in like Mardu vehicles and zombies and like it was in so many different things. So uh, it's like, can I actually yeah. find one more of these? And and I could, you know, someone who was originally planning on bringing vehicles, but then decided they were actually going to go with Marvel was like, oh, well, I have one you can borrow. And, and uh, you know, that sort of community is uh, is awesome. Yeah, yeah. and if, if we do end up going, there's definitely going to be an Into the North uh, crowdsourcing, or not crowdsource, sorry, like internal, like, can we build everyone's decks? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> talk. We'll definitely have that. One thing too is like even if like let's just say you can't find all the cards for um your deck you know not including the the ones that are allowed to be proxied like there are plenty of side events happening it's still going to be just like a GP so there's tons of fun to be had and of course there's going to be CDH happening um you know oh. after tournament hours at the bar as you said like and I'm sure at that point uh, no one's oh, complaining so exactly so like the uh, event hall can host 550 people and the majority of people there will be just there for the si free side events for trading for meeting artists talking to content creators being like we are putting on a show on friday it's i cannot talk about it yet because it's not set in stone but we are planning on doing some fun content before the seriousness starts um, Saturday morning. Um, so this is much more than a CDH tournament. The CDH tournament is just the big uh, name thing on the, uh, the poster. World Championship. Yes, um, that's another thing. <laughs> <laughs> we knew that we might get uh, a bit of flack for doing that. Um, but what is a world championship? It's open to enter. We are putting on the biggest tournament, as as far as I know, that's ever been hosted in for Commander. That is not a Wizards event. Um, again, some people got mad at us, but I mean, again, you cannot make everybody happy. And I'll be happy to call whoever wins our tournament the world champion. And uh, I hope I get to give the person uh, a time twister. I really, really hope yeah. we can get 250 players because I want to give a time twister away. Yeah, how how dare you try and market your tournament, you know? Like, just the <laughs> worst. <laughs> yeah. I, I also don't mind, you know, other people trying to contend 
at the World Championship. You know, maybe we could have a couple big tournaments. Yeah, you know what? If every if every large <laughs> tournament called themselves the World Championship, I don't know that we would lose much. No. <laughs> and we were just... We were, again, as I said, we were trying to be a bit brazen because we knew it, it would get some reactions. and But we also just hoped that it would entice players to come because if this tournament becomes the success we hope it becomes, it's not unlikely that we will host it again in another country um, that is not Denmark. Um, so this could be sort of a flying circus thing. Um, but obviously it all depends on the success of this first one. Of course. Um, if we don't have anything more to add about Tier 1 Con, uh, I guess we can move on to our next section. So before we do, is there any last last thing you want to add? Uh, or should we keep going? No, I just hope people are excited about it. And uh, we are, for all the guy, everybody that cannot participate, we are streaming the entirety of the CDH tournament. As I said, we are going to have some content on Friday where the CDH panel will be the main thing, but there's also going to be other stuff. And then there's going to be the dual commander finals also going to be streamed. And all of that is on tier one MTG's Twitch channel. All right. Yeah, that uh, definitely will be cool for people who, who can't make it out to, you know, still really be able to, to follow the event. Yes. And Yep. All you listeners, I want to play some CDAs during that weekend, so meet me in the bar after the last round each day. Yeah, I'll I'll definitely have to get a game in against you, assuming I can I can make it out. You know. Yeah, yep. I don't. I have to figure out how to uh, win that, or have a valid excuse to why I lost to you, because I think oh, I've well, said multiple mul multiple times on stream that I taught you everything you know. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know what? You're right. It it wouldn't really be fair. You'll have spent 12 hours commentating in the booth. You'll be tired. Like, come on. It, yes. Everyone will know that that's exactly. not that's not a fair a fair yeah. game. I think the commentator curse still applies for games after the coverage. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Sure. So. <laughs> All right. So True. if there's uh, if there's nothing more to say about that, I guess we can move on to everyone's favorite segment. Gut check. <laughs> I'm not used to you saying it in the way that Lennon says it. Yeah, well, you know, there's only <laughs> two of us, so I, I have to. Uh, All right. So I do, I do have one, unless uh, like Lyndon did, came in with one, unless you've got one. All right, no, let's let's go with Lyndon's. I my I have sure. one, but it's uh, we've it's similar to one we've done before, so. I, I can hear Morgan the grin on your face. I'm I'm looking forward to this question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here here's here it is. Uh so what 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 is your most memorable tournament experience? It doesn't have to be CDH, just magic tournament experience. Oh that um I was lucky enough to uh, top eight a legacy GP and that was obviously my most memorable uh, uh magic experience. It was in Birmingham in twenty eighteen. Um I uh, scraped myself into day two on an X2 record, meaning that I could not afford to lose any matches on day two if I wanted to top eight. Um, so I went into day two, uh, backs against the wall, and won my five rounds. And I had a few really close calls. But uh, I snuck into top eight on sixth place and got to play uh, Gregos Kowalski in the top eight, which at that point was one of the best Magic players around. Probably still is. I don't follow Pro Magic anymore, so I'm not sure. But um, that was an insane experience. And um, the last two rounds of the GP, I was playing um, on camera for the first time ever. And um, when I win, in the last round before top eight, I could hear my friends from outside the coverage area just screaming and cheering for me, and that was so cool. All right, I think. Well, that's way better than anything I had. Yeah, so. mine's uh, <laughs> mine's actually. It, it was kind of a negative experience, but I don't know. It just 
uh, I'll never forget um, when I was playing uh, in GP Montreal, and I think it was 2017. This was like just shortly before Aetherworks Marvel was banned, finally. Um, I played against an opponent. I, I think I actually wound up winning the match, but in one of the games, they they curved uh, turn one. Okay, so this is a little bit hard to explain, but you need the six energy to activate the Aetherworks Marvel um, and on turn four. And uh, the decks, a lot of the fixing in the deck came from um, Aether Hub, which gives you an energy when you put it into play, but then you have to spend the energy to make mana of any color. Um, so they played a, a perfect curve of uh, turn one one of the decks like two game trails which is one of the very few untapped lands that doesn't spend energy and makes both green and red to play a tune with aether into the puzzle knot uh on turn two to gain three life into sweltering suns to wipe my board on turn three into ulamog <laughs> into marvel flipping ulamog on turn four wow and i was just like That's, uh... <laughs> what what could i possibly have done differently in this like i i I guess. And and yeah, so it was like, you know, they needed to get exactly six energy from an Aether Hub that they never had to tap for colored mana. And then they needed to cast a green one drop on turn uh one and a double red spell on turn three without needing to use the Aether Hub's energy. And it was just like, I right, you know what, I guess. Yeah, wow. And then, <laughs> and then in the ultimate vindication, it was banned like a month later. And I was like, "See, I knew it was. Yeah. I knew it was unfair." <laughs> yeah, couldn't just delay the tournament one month. Exactly. And Matt, well, how about you? Sure. My experience is, um, I don't remember very many details, but um, I was at one of my. I think it was my first GP ever with my brother. Uh, and I played a standard buy box um, side event and ended up winning the box. Nice. Journey into journey into Nyx. Nice. Yeah. All right, and uh, we have we have one listener question that's uh, a bit of a funny one, and we thought it would be good to get an outside perspective. On. <laughs> uh, so this question comes to us courtesy of Jeffrey, and it is. If the Into the North crew all had power and toughness, what would they be? <laughs> so, I think... Let's start with you, Jay. You know what? Just, just throw them out there. Okay. Okay. Um, I mean... <laughs> ah, this is rough. Um, so... You obviously, Morgan, you uh, were the dominant force in our webcam series, uh, and as uh, as much as I tried to uh, take you down a notch, you just kept on winning. Um, so, what is a solid PT for you? Um, I think you're a uh, uh, a ball lightning, a six one trampler. Six one. All right, interesting. Six one. <laughs> Oh, man. Um, oh, and then we can go. Um, s read. How many did he participate in? Two or three? I think two or three. Yeah. Yeah. So I would give him. He's a. Uh, uh, whatever the creature, the three three with vanishing for two mana. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um. <laughs> And Matt, you didn't participate in any of our tournament, right? So I am. I was in the, I was in the last one. I was in the last. You were in the last one. We were all didn't in the do last too well. One. Oh, you were yeah. all in the last one. Okay. Uh, well, look how much I remember for that one. Uh, okay. Uh, you're a wall of omens. You are O three that draws a card. Yeah, I am. Wall of omens is an O four. Don't sell them short. Oh, oh. <laughs> sorry. O four. Uh, and noob. He's the color shift. Uh, he's the wall of blossoms. Then, okay. So we've got <laughs> two O four walls that draw a card, a three two with vanishing, and a six one that dies at the end of the turn. All right. With trample. Right. I, oh, with trample, of course, of course. Yes. Um, and uh... so, so is this? 
Is this your covert way of predicting that I'm just going to, like, O2 drop at Tier 1 Con in the summer? I, <laughs> I just have no longevity? You, you pack a mean punch, but uh, <laughs> you might not go all the way. All right, all right. Well, <laughs> now, now there's just, now there's even more pressure. All right, all right. Yeah. All right. I, I'm happy that you gave me at least three toughness. Because I'm always blocking ten minutes. <laughs> but I mean, did that's... I? You had four toughness, right? Yeah. Didn't. Okay. That's <laughs> yeah, no, that's good enough. That's good, Get there. Yeah. yeah. Just need to be able to block the timnas. That's. Uh... I mean, you just you just need to befriend Doran, and then you're golden. Then you're better than Morgan. Yeah. Wait. Yeah. Hang on a second. <laughs> let's not let's not jump to conclusions about. Um... <laughs> I mean, ball lightning with Doran is. It's is not awkward. great, admittedly. <laughs> okay. Um, don't ask me how to like to explain the reasoning behind it. I just it was a gut feeling. You know what? You know yeah. what? It's uh I, I, I don't the think that correct. there's a there's an objective way of, of figuring <laughs> no. this one out. So I think Except you're in the clear on answers. giving an opinion or a gut feeling. Matt, any any radical changes you'd suggest? Um, well, I would make Reed a 3-2, and I uh, think we're all familiar with that power and toughness. Um, just immediately stands out to me. I uh, mean... And then... Yeah? I should actually change my thing on Reed, because we all remember how he forgot to attack with Thrasius, and that cost him the game. <laughs> So so he's a 2-3 because he's missing that crucial one point of damage? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, uh, and also, he is happy to take a Tim to hit, so... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, that's that's why I like the 3-2, the because Reed never, <laughs> never blocks the Tim now. Always, always goes for the greedy play. I feel like I feel like I kind of need to be something that can block a Timna though, you know? That's that's Yeah. I I mean I kinda cheaped out for my last year, but uh both you uh both Morgan and Lyndon are six sixes because of uh the uh commanders that we chose them to be oh, for the last year. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but Lyndon has and then I, I'm a zero zero. Oh, no. I wait, what? How are you a zero zero? <laughs> I I've got some Special abilities? I don't know. I enter with counters, or maybe, uh, my, maybe I have Devour X. Who knows? C clone. Yeah, yeah, clone? That's, yeah. Yeah. Or Balduvian Warlord. That has that fascinated a young me back in the days. I traded my valuable clone for a Balduvian Warlord. I think it's the name. Do you guys remember, like the, the one? It's really buff warrior that was a terrible guard, but he looked so menacing that I thought he was good when I was a kid. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Just uh, the the old card evaluations, the things that you thought yeah. were like, oh, this card was just so good. It was the terror of my play group, and then you look at it now, and you're like, this card. I don't know how much you'd have to pay me to put this card in my deck. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Maybe Miscutter Hydra is not the right one. <laughs> I think for me that card was uh, Titanic Bulvox, which is a seven four with trample for eight, or you can morph it in like it has morph, and it only costs seven to to turn it face up. <laughs> only oh, nice. so for the, I, have, I have this card for the low low price yeah. of ten mana over two turns. You can get a seven four with trample. Hell Huge. yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I guess that about wraps it up for this episode. Uh, thanks again, Jay, for joining us. Is there anything you'd, uh, you know, like to tell the listeners about or, you know, just quickly plug tier one again mm, or anything? Yeah, no, again, I'll just uh, uh, send a plea out there that if you are in any way interested in tier one and are part of the community come and support the tournament because we want to show not only uh tier one that this is 
something that we can do again, but we also want to show Wizards that CDH can be a real tournament format. All because right. Uh, yeah, so definitely uh, show up if you can. And uh, if you guys would like to reach out to us with any questions, comments, or concerns, you can contact us on Twitter at Into the North Pod via our email at Into the North Podcast at gmail.com or on our Discord server, the invite link for which can be found in the description for this episode. An extra special thanks to all of our patrons who help cover the expenses for our show and allow us to work towards improving the quality of the podcast. If you too would like to become a patron, we are at patreon.com slash Into the North Podcast. Another way you can support us is via our TCG Player affiliate link. Anytime you want to purchase something from TCG Player, if you use our affiliate link, which is in the podcast slash YouTube description, a portion of your purchase goes towards supporting the podcast. Thank you as always to the band Fox Cadre for our lovely podcast music, to Nate Slover for our equally lovely podcast logo, and to our video editor, Manta Ray Hat. Next episode will be out in two weeks. Until then, see ya. Bye.